Hello, Graham. Welcome back to the UFPA Philosophy Lectures. Hi, Emiliano. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Yourself? Yes, uh, still hold up just outside New York. Um, a troubled city, but uh, the troubles haven't quite stretched this far yet. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so, so last time... Um, we talked about the logical paradoxes uh, which seem to emerge from within the intellect uh, uh, itself. Today, I would like to talk about uh, time and change. Uh, time and change appear to present us with a conflict between uh, what we may call reasons of experience uh, on the one hand and, and reasons of the intellect on the other. So we, we perceive the world as changing. Sometimes we we compare past memories uh, 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 with uh, present experiences. Uh, sometimes we even seem to spot change in the making, as it were, like when we see a bird flying or, or the waves of the ocean approaching. Uh, we sense uh, the passage of time. We are acutely aware of it. And, and uh, as uh, William James uh, put it, uh, say now, and uh, it was, even while you say it. Uh, uh, now, when, uh, since when we, we tried to explicate in conceptual terms uh, all these notions, motion and change and passage, uh, um, at the dawn of uh, Western thought, we encountered uh, some profound difficulties uh, which proved, uh, which proved uh, amazingly recalcitrant. And, and perhaps the, the earliest and best example uh, of these uh, are the Zeno's uh, paradoxes of motion, which I would like to discuss with you today. Um, uh, to get us started, could you give us uh, uh, your favorite formulation of the paradox of the arrow? Okay, sure. Um, let, let, let me, if I may, sort of go back a little bit further than that, and we'll get to that in due course. Um, I mean, for a start, um, last week, you raised the question of what arguments one might give for dialethism. And we talked to, at length last week about the liar paradox and other paradoxes of self-reference. That, that's one general area where, of pe where people have found an application for dialethism. And certainly mo theories of motion are another. So there are a number of people who think that change realizes contradiction, uh, including Hegel, I think we might have talked a bit about Hegel a few weeks ago, uh, and certainly I do. So um, what, what's in the background here is a discussion of whether uh, you can use the phenomenon of motion to generate an argument for dialethism. So we'll, we'll come back to the details later, but that's on the agenda, right? Um, so next, a little bit of history, just to contextualize this. Um, you mentioned Zeno, of course, a very famous ancient Greek philosopher. And um, Zeno had a number of arguments. Um, reputedly, he wrote a book, which we don't have. So all we know of Zeno is what's reported by other people, particularly Plato and Aristotle and, and some others. Um, so nobody knows what exactly was in his book, and it's conjectural as to why he wrote it. However, um, what Plato tells us in the Parmenides, <clears throat> which may or may not be right, but it's certainly Plato's picture, is this. Um, there was um, an ancient philosopher called Parmenides, <clears throat> and Parmenides argued for the somewhat implausible thesis that nothing changes. Um, highly counterintuitive. Um, but Parmenides said that all, all things in themselves don't change, it's only appearance that changes. Okay, Let, let's leave that question aside. Um, that in itself is an obvious claim, is, is an interesting claim. I, I note that um, perhaps the person who's taken up the Parmenidean picture more than anybody else is um, you, your countryman, Manuel Severino, yeah. who based his whole philosophy around this. Um, 
uh, Manuele sadly died earlier this year, but mm -hmm. um, he was certainly the most famous, I think, of the neo Um Okay, so Parmenides defended the view that, that nothing changes. Um, and this sounds kind of crazy. Now, according to Plato, Zeno was uh, a student of Parmenides and uh, his book that I mentioned was written in defense of him. And um, when uh, Plato asks him about the book uh, and his connection with Parmenides, um, Oh, actually, it's not, it's not Plato, it's uh, Plato's mouthpiece, Socrates. Uh, uh, anyway, when, when he asks him, Plato has uh, Zeno say, look, hey, hey, you know, I'm a student of uh, Parmenides. You think that Parmenides is crazy. Um, let me show you that your view is just as crazy, right? Because you think that things change, don't you? Well, you know, if things change, then I'm going to show you that all kinds of conditions contradictions arise and you know, Plato wasn't a great a friend of dialetheism so at least if Plato is right then um, Zeno's book was an attempt to defend Parmenides simply by showing that that change would realize contradictions um, the book had lots of arguments and it's mainly the um, arguments about motion that have um, uh, come down to us through people like Aristotle, and there were essentially four. Um, we don't need to sort of hammer through the details now. Um, the most famous is not the arrow. The most famous is probably Achilles and the tortoise. Um, and it goes something like this, you know, so suppose you've got a race between Achilles and the tortoise. The tortoise is slower, so he gives... Um, Achilles gives him a head start. Okay, so they start to race. Now, by the time that Achilles gets to where the tortoise was, the tortoise has gone a bit further. So by the time that Achilles gets there, the tortoise will have gone a bit further. And because the tortoise is always moving, wherever Achilles gets to where the tortoise was, the tortoise has gone a bit further. Therefore, Achilles can never overtake the tortoise. But of course he does. So there's your contradiction. Um... That's the most famous, um, but I don't think personally it's the most profound. Um, the most profound, I think, is the arrow. Um, and the arrow goes like this. Suppose you take an archer who fires an arrow and just take the arrow in motion and take, you know, it's just at the tip of the arrow, a point. Now, choose any instant of the motion. Um, at that instant, the point of the arrow is exactly where it is. And because it is an instant, during that instant, the arrow makes, or the point of the arrow, makes no progress on its journey. So, in any instant of the motion, progress made equals zero. But um, assuming that time is made up of instants, which is of course the standard view in physics, um, time is made up, is, it's composed of these inference, instants. So um, progress made in the totality equals progress made in each instance uh, added together progress made in an instant is zero and zero plus zero plus zero as many times as you like even infinitely many times is zero so uh, progress made in the journey is zero so the arrow doesn't move um, which of course it does and uh, there's your contradiction so th those are um, probably the most famous of uh, Zeno's arguments, and I think the most profound. Okay, so uh, I think you wanted me to describe the arrow paradox, there it is. <laughs>